Hello everyone, welcome to Historically Accurate. In my last episode, I talked about how did the young king, Ying Zheng, get rid of his enemies step by step and eventually take control of Qing state. In the next few episodes, I will talk about how did Ying Zheng defeat the other six states within only a decade and establish the Qing dynasty. In 246 BC, one year after the 14-year-old Ying Zheng succeeded to the throne, Qing began to build a canal. Because the project was designed and managed by a water conservancy expert named Zheng Guo, who came from Han State, the canal was called Zheng Guo Canal. Ten years ago, when Ying Zheng's great-grandfather, King Zhao Xiang of Qing, was still alive, Qing State built a famous water conservancy project, Du Jiang Yan. I have previously introduced Du Jiang Yan in my video about ancient Chinese water conservancy projects. Please check that video if you are interested. So why did Qing State want to build another water conservancy project after just 10 years? This is because Zheng Guo was a spy from Han State and he advised Qing to build another water conservancy project in order to consume Qing's national power so Qing wouldn't be able to attack Han State. Zheng Guo's true purpose was discovered later in the construction stage of the project. Zheng Guo argued that although building the canal consumed Qing's national power, it was only temporary. Once the project was completed, the canal would bring water to irrigate large area of barren land, allowing Qing State to always own a significant amount of fertile farmland. This project would eventually benefit Qing. In the end, Ying Zheng forgave Zheng Guo and asked him to complete the construction. And after Zheng Guo Canal was built, it did play a huge role in Qing State's prosperity as Zheng Guo said. During that time, Qing State hired a lot of talents from other states. However, Ying Zheng's trust in foreign talents was damaged by the fact that Zheng Guo was a spy. In addition, a large portion of the 3,000 retainers working for Lü Buwei, the chancellor of Qing State at that time, were from the other six states as well. As a result, Ying Zheng issued an order to expel all foreign talents from Qing State. This would resolve the trust issue and also greatly weaken Lü Buwei's influence. Li Si, one of Lü Buwei's retainers, came from Chu State and was also included in the list of foreign talents to be expelled. He wrote the well-known petition against the expulsion of guest officers to Ying Zheng, which mainly talked about that Qing State became a superpower because its monarchs hired countless foreign talents to work for Qing. Without these foreign talents, there was no way for Qing to become a truly powerful state. Ying Zheng finally followed Li Si's suggestion and abolished the order to expel foreign talents. He also began to promote Li Si and Wei Liao, another very strategic talent from Wei State, to important positions. With the help of Li Si and Wei Liao, Ying Zheng promoted a group of young generals and also recruited and trained many soldiers. Qing's main troops once reached about 600,000. If the guards at the border and the local garrisons were included, Qing's total troops could be around 800,000. Most men of the eligible age in the state were recruited to serve as soldiers. You may have a question, why could Qing mobilize a large population to serve as soldiers? but at the same time, the agricultural production wasn't interrupted. The efficiency of agricultural production 2,300 years ago was extremely low compared with current efficiency. Therefore, it required a large number of people to engage in agricultural production. At the same time, the huge army required a significant amount of food supplies. 
Qin as one of the seven vassal states in the Warring States period, didn't occupy the largest area, didn't own the most fertile land, and didn't have many local talents, but it was able to defeat all the other six states in the end. How did Qin make it? To explain this, I need to talk about Xiangyang's reforms which greatly improved the strength of Qin state. Before Xiangyang's reforms, Qin state experienced decades of political turmoil. In the wars against the other states, Qin state was repeatedly defeated by its mortal enemy, Wei state. The new king at that time, Duke Xiao of Qin, ceded a large area of land to Wei in exchange for peace. He then sent out an announcement calling for tenants from all states to become officials in Qin state. In 360 BC, Xiangyang, a young and talented man from Wei state, came to Qin to become official after he heard the announcement made by Duke Xiao of Qin. Who was Duke Xiao of Qin? He was the grandfather of King Zhaoxiang of Qin, who was the grandfather of Yi Ren. During that time in Qin, land was allocated to the small group of nobilities based on their ranks. No matter how hard they worked, the serfs could barely make ends meet. Therefore, they lacked the motivation to work hard and the efficiency of agricultural production was very low. It was imperative to implement reforms to enhance national power. However, if Duke Xiao of Qin wanted to implement reforms, he must convince his people that he had the determination and capability to do so. Xiangyang thought of a way to do that. He asked his men to put a long log in front of the southern entrance of the market in the capital city and announced to the public that if anyone moved the log from the southern entrance to the northern entrance of the market, he would give that person 10 pieces of gold. The people felt strange about this announcement and no one touched the log. So Xiangyang raised the reward to 50 pieces of gold and finally one person moved the log to northern gate in doubt. Xiangyang immediately gave that person 50 pieces of gold. In this way, Xiangyang rebuilt the people's confidence in the Qin government. The previous Qin government probably didn't have much credibility with its people. That is to say, it fell into the Tacitus trap, and Xiangyang's exaggerated move might be the earliest example of how to get a government out of the Tacitus trap. If you know any other examples, please share with me in the comment below. What did Xiangyang and Duke Xiao of Qin do after they earned the trust of the people? Simply put, they implemented two sets of in-depth reforms. The main keyword of the first set of in-depth reforms was incentive. First, Xiangyang implemented the Military Achievement Reward Law. This law abolished the previous hereditary nobility system and applied to all the men who were able to join the army in Qin state. All Qin people could only receive rewards and nobility title based on their military achievements. Even family members of the king couldn't enjoy the royal treatment without military achievements. The nobility title was subdivided into 20 ranks and were rewarded to soldiers by the number of enemy kills. In fact, this way of rewarding soldiers by number of beheaded enemies were used by the other six states as well. But Qin state made a distinction between the evaluation criteria for military officers and the evaluation criteria for soldiers so as to avoid the situation in which the officers were busy beheading the enemies and forgot to command the soldiers to fight. Later on, there were laws expressly prohibiting generals from personally fighting against the enemy. The achievements of generals and officers were evaluated based on the number of enemies' heads collected by their soldiers. If two soldiers fought over the heads, the witness had an absolute obligation to stop them. Otherwise, both two soldiers and the witness would be punished. 
It was required that the severed head must retain Adam's apple in order to prevent soldiers from indiscriminately killing women for their heads. According to the laws, the number of heads severed in each battle needed to be counted and calculated, and the nobility title was rewarded to the right person within three days. If anyone disagreed with the result, there was a special court to judge the attribution of the heads. Officials would be punished if they couldn't complete the count and calculation in time. You can imagine that after each battle, a group of officials would stand in front of piles of heads, which were as tall as hills, and counted and calculated the numbers, while soldiers besides the officials were talking and laughing, and each of them were still holding a few heads. Food rations and monetary rewards for each of the twenty rank titles were significantly different. Soldiers without a title could only get food rations, which barely fed them. Soldiers of the second rank title would receive enough coarse grains. Soldiers of the third rank title could get polished rice and pickles. In addition, titles could be exchanged for other things. For example, if a soldier's family member was a criminal or a slave. That soldier could exchange his title for the freedom of his family member. If a battle was very difficult, the threshold to get the title would be lowered accordingly. A soldier with the title didn't need to worry about being killed in a battle, because his family could inherit his title after his death. Such an incentive mechanism simply awakened the inner beast of human beings to the fullest extent. When Qin people heard that they were fighting battles, everybody would congratulate each other on this news, like what they did for Chinese New Year. Kids would make nursery rhymes to extol the battles. When Qin people heard about battles, they reacted like hungry wolves seeing meat. Second, Xiangyang encouraged and rewarded farming. Farmers could be rewarded with nobility titles if they contributed certain amount of grains to the government, reclaimed barren lands, or engaged in activities such as animal husbandry, breeding and raising silkworms, and textile manufacturing. Third, Xiangyang strenuously rectified the administration of officials and prohibited political rumors. The main purpose was to stop the rumors spread by those who opposed the reforms. Many harsh punishments were implemented to support this reform. Not only would the perpetrators be punished more severely, but their family and friends also would be punished. The first set of reforms made Qin people very happy. Ethos of the entire Qin state went higher. And Qin won most of its battle against the other states. Many people began to praise the reforms. However, in order to completely stop Qin people from commenting on the government laws, Xiangyang even punished the people who praised the reforms. This sounds really ridiculous to us nowadays. Not long after this set of reforms were implemented. Qin's national power was significantly improved. It also achieved satisfactory results in the battles with its mortal enemy, Wei State. Qin won four times and only lost once. However, the first set of reforms were not Xiangyang's most powerful reforms. Xiangyang's second set of reforms were actually the reforms that laid the foundation for Qin's unification of the other six states. The content of this set of reforms were largely inherited and promoted by the Qin Empire that unified China a hundred years later. We will stop here due to time limit. If you want to know more about Xiangyang's second set of reforms and how the reforms helped Yinzhen to unify the other six states a hundred years later, please check my next episode. See you next time.